out. <laughs> the media of our ancestors was the world around them. And the game they played was survival. And when something moved in the, over in the bushes, well, they had to look at it because it might be something that they were looking for or something that was looking for them. You can see it down there in the bottom. And you, all of us in this room today, are the children of the survivors or the ones that looked. Because the ones that didn't look didn't make it. And the desire, the hard baked, um, deep core um, need to look at something that moves baked into our brains. So that when that little banner hat pops up and goes like this, you cannot look at it. Annoying as it is, you can't look at it because it might be something dangerous. And that's the way it works for kids. So movement gets attention. Uh, and it, you know, the younger the kid is like, what is that? It's moving, it's alive. And for interactivity, it's terrific. But even out in the world, they're just automatically drawn to this. And the next thing they want to know is what's it do? <laughs> so this is the same, this has been going on for millennia. Kids out exploring. And they want to touch that frog and see, does it jump? What does it move? Does it bark? What happens? And that's what interactivity is all about. That's why kids are drawn to the screen. They're not out in the woods as much as they used to be. They're not out exploring. They don't have time to go out, and parents don't want them out um, having that self-directed play. So where do they do self-directed play? In software. And that's why animation is important, because it takes us to these other places. And So movement gets our attention, and I think it's time to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta go back, it's jumping on the screen on me. Go back one more time. Well, I'm having the same problems as everybody else. There's a, it's supposed to be animated. There it is. There we go. So, if there's anything moving, we follow that action. <laughs> and what happens is, is we follow the biggest action. So, you're watching the ladybug, and when the other characters go through, the ladybug gets eclipsed for them running through. And we don't know we were doing other books, we, had, we were running in these really slow machines, and we had, we had ambience, so we had clouds going by, we had all these different things happening in the scene, waterfalls and islands on the characters. And, the machines could barely handle that. And as soon as we made something happen, um, they would, the machines, slower machines, low end machines in schools would drop down too slow. We found out that we could turn everything off except the one thing that was moving, because that's where your eye went. So all the ambience, the clouds, all that, nobody ever saw any of that, like the characters running through. So it began, you know, you, you begin to see over and over where does the eye go? What, what's happening when you're when you're doing that? And when we were doing living books, we uh, we had high, the first some of the first we did have the first highlighted text. We actually have the patent on clicking on a word and if it highlights and says something, we own that. Except that never enforceable, never would try. But it's interesting that they would even give it to us. I think. But um, we we first started by having kids come out, a character come out. I was thinking, well, I'll do it like the preceding marks. We had a prototype. Of a little monster at school, and it said, um, when I get up in the morning, I get dressed and go downstairs to breakfast. And I thought, well, there's the actor talking. He's doing his own dialogue, so I'll have him just walk into the scene and, um, you know, out of the proscenium you march there and, and say the words, and then the text will be highlighted. And I put it in front of kids, and none of them watched the text. They looked at the character's mouth. <laughs> All of them looked at the character's mouth. We went, no, oh, okay, that doesn't work. So then we had to, we let them, the dialogue run, the highlighting. The kids would follow the highlighting, and then the character would bound into the scene. So figuring out where your eye goes is important. So as we said, if it moves, it's alive. And if you add eyes, it becomes conscious. And we see this in a lot of products. Um, Dan Russell. Vincent, our friend who comes here and speaks a lot, added eyes to stack the stakes. You know, so I added eyes, but that's part.
harder to draw for kids. <coughs> because now they're alive. Now they're conscious. Those eyes made him a lot of money. Those eyes made him a lot of money because he was early into the market with something that spoke to a need. And, and then you can go just a little bit farther and you had a mouth. And now you got personality. So it's not just alive, it's not just conscious, but now it's got personality and you can do something else with it. And by animating simple illustrations and adding a few sound effects, whole worlds can be applied. You know, it doesn't have to be real high res, it doesn't have to be real fancy. Animation is an illusion. It's all about fooling the brain. And the next thing I want to talk about is closure. Because closure, this thing that happens naturally, is by uh, understanding how the world happens, you can understand a lot of the tricks of animation. And in fact, the guys who, um, um, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, two of the seven old men at Disney, uh, wrote a book called uh, Disney Animation, The Illusion of Life. And that's what we're doing, is that we're, in animation, we're creating the illusion of life. And it isn't hard to do. In fact, the simpler the better, because we put ourselves into it. We add into it, and the fancier it is, the more we are critical of what it is. The simpler it is, the more we can identify with it. So I'm just going to talk a second about closure, because it's a subject I'm exploring. Um, it's, it's how our brain likes to fill things in. We like to know what's going on, and kids you know, use closure to uh, leap to uh, fantastical explanations of how the world works. It's one of the things they do. Um, because closure fills in the gaps between the known and the unknown in our conscious mind. In our, and, um, so how we actively participate in media is to fill in the blanks with our imagination. And you think, you know, in comic books, this is where it's classic, where um, the characters go to do something, and then you hear bang, crash, pow, and then, you know, you don't see any of that. All you do is you hear the scream, and then you go, oh, something, you imagine what happened. And it's funny because even even the books are like this. Um, um, I'm trying to think of this. One of the science fiction writers um, said that text was the ultimate software because it decompresses in your head. You, you're using your imagination. You're using closure to imagine the kind of things that happen. So what is the, what is closure? You know. So what is this? Tire, yeah. Okay. Actually, it's just a black and white shape. <laughs> it's neither a tire or even a picture of a tire. It's just a black and white silhouette. But your mind just used closure to tell you, oh, oh, that's a that's a tire. It's a tire. I know what that is because it fills in the gap in our knowledge. So it's like a spark that happens all the time. It's happening all the time, and it happens so much that it's unconscious to us. So. Um, you look at a light socket, and you know, do you see the faces in there? <laughs> no, I look at it and I go, oh my god, the light socket's scared because there's a tiger nearby. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all happening with closure. This is all happening in our heads. It's not really there on any of those things. But because we're so wired to see faces, we, we, we do this. Um, so, let's see if this plays. So, closure helps us to make animation cheap. This is my part of my talk here. It's because I didn't have to. I didn't have to animate breaking glass. I didn't have to make. Uh, I didn't, you didn't have to see stepping on the cat. You know, and I could have added ten more things in there, and it would have all happened. When we were working on this book, The Tortoise and the Hare, uh, we would have him come out of the house and run around the house behind his tree, and That's right. he would push his teeth, he would do the toilet flush, you know. We had some right. different ones, and we'd use the same animation and just put a different sound effect. And they go, oh, he's going to the bathroom, oh, he brushes his teeth, you know, just like. Uh, because with closure, you're filling in all the pieces, and it's made for a lot of cheap animation. So I'm going to talk about animation basics a little bit because they're really simple 
and yet we don't use them at half enough. And when we were doing little words, we were using all the flat basic pieces to, um, sorry, to, to make the words move, to make the words come alive. What if words were toys? Is the idea of, of little words. And so this is a kind of basic, you know, it compresses when it goes down, it extends when it goes up. And but when you see it in fluid motion, you just go, your mind loses it all together and goes, oh, it's a ball. The ball is fast. But when you do it with a character, so here's a, I, I try to make this a little slow. Here's a slow jump. Now, actually, that's how compressed he is in that, what you just saw. Yes. No, it wasn't just in three, there was, there was a few more steps in there, but I'm going to, because when, when it was compressed, it actually compressed, it squashed that much, and it stretched that much. Can you do it again? I can't, because I knew you, just because I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> and that's where your mind is stitching all the pieces together. What you saw was the jump, and it looks just natural, except that there was a lot of squash and stretch. Here's it again. <laughs> and I did it slow. So you kind of get a feel for it. But you can do it so much with just a little bit of um, moving around. So here's another one. And then here's uh, his steps. Same thing, stretched. Very squished. And um, so, but he, it's, just, it's amazing how you don't see it. And when we're animating, we think, oh, this looks good, you squish it. And it looks like nothing. And so you exaggerate, we'll get to exaggeration, but you keep pushing those exaggerations, and the more you exaggerate it, the better it looks. To a point, of course. Um, the next thing is anticipation and follow through. And you've seen it in millions of cartoons. Um, and this is kind of classic, the baseball here, he's pulling back, and then you have the follow through. And, um, but, um, Really, where you see it in animation, you think of uh, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. You know, before they go that way, they go this way. It's like Jackie Gleason used to go, away we go, you know. You're pulling the bow back to do the shot and release it. And it, it signals your intention to go there. So the character, here he is. He's pulling back to take off. And then when he goes, he has to have momentum. So he's overcoming inertia to move. This is the illusion of life. And then when you come to a stop, oh, no, 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 no. think of road when it comes to a stop. <laughs> you know, you've all seen it a million times, but you don't think about it. So, um, and this is using a little piece of motion blur here, a very cheap way to make that happen. You can also just do it by stretching things in different directions, but a little bit of animation tricking like this goes a long way. So here it is. Let's try that again. You can see him run in and then do it. <laughs> That's um, anticipation and follow through. And this is a subject that doesn't be talked much about is motion blur. This is from the tortoise in here, 1992. Running on in two mega RAM. <laughs> on an Apple, whatever it was, with a 510 screen. So it's very small, very slow compressor, um, and um, we had the tortoise in the hair. Well, it was easy for the tortoise, <laughs> because it was slow. We could, <laughs> not find, we, could, we could not figure out how to get the, the hair to go fast. So you can see there's most of blurs, particularly the two on the left and the ones on the right. And uh, one of our um, programmers was a laser disc Aficionado, and he brought in all the Warner Brothers laser discs and an animator set and looked at how that Warner Brothers have been doing it for years to get motion blur. And we just created those images and on the left there said so he comes out of his house to actually pick up the paper in the morning and instead of trying to do 10 frames of him running, there's two. Bad he's out. And it was like, oh, that didn't take a lot of room. That looked really fast. So, and this is, you can see there's a whole sequence here. I'll talk a little bit about motion blur later. Um, but exaggeration is the other thing. We talked about stretching the character, how making all those things happen. And 
The thing about these edge arrays is that an animation allows us to push characters, expressions, and reactions way beyond what we think of as normal. And in doing so, it allows the essence of the emotion or the action to clearly uh, be understood and felt. In interactive software, exaggeration works well to intensify big reactions in characters and objects after a child triggers an event. As a, a big payoff, even if it is very quick, as a lot to the experience due to the surprise factor and the sense of empowerment it gives the child. Which was just a ball that rolled around. 
And it was interesting to me that even though that was a pretty good app, you think so far? Yeah, I thought it was the best. It was a great app, and he thought it was a good app too. But Olaf didn't have a mouth. So he, did, he misses that, he's, from my point of view, he's missing that personality a little bit. But actually, it was a wonderful app. But so here's three ways of tricking, tricking you, know, saving you on animation time. And um, so let's go back to the motion blurs for a second. I can write one out here. Uh, here's three different uh, ways of blurring something. And then here's an example. That's the first one. To make that run, there's only two frames of animation. The feet change a little bit and there's an arm change. Uh, and when I did this, I made my character's legs black so that when he was running, I didn't have to have a front leg and a back leg like we did in the other part. It simplified the animations. And then uh, you can see it again. Of course, the sound effect helps a lot. Now, um, when, you, when I wanted to go really fast, um, I had, had to push the landing over a little bit more, but I'm actually only using one frame, that frame on the right, but it goes so fast that your eye can only catch a shot of it, and I'll do it again. <laughs> That's cheap animation, yeah. but it looks like I animated and running across the screen. Here's a couple other quick ones. That's one frame. There's two frames for that, one going this way and one going this way. But it looks like we're getting a lot of action. Two frames of animation and just tilting it in both directions. So that's that's cheap animation, but the sound is the magic part because it implies it feels in the rest of the experience. So why is the animation important? Um, we know that it gets their attention. Uh, we know that they, they, uh, it, it piques their curiosity, and, but primarily it creates the wow factor. It's that piece that brings it alive for them. It's, it's what they can do, what they can control a little bit 